Cheers. You, you're here, so you obviously know who these guys are. Cool. <laughs> Mike, Scott, and um, this is a clinic about songwriting, and um, it's kind of free form, so we're basically, um, you know, there's the obvious questions and whatnot, but any kind of audience participation as far as questions go. If you ask the question, I'll repeat it, and then whichever person can answer it, or collectively, or however. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's free form, so there's, we don't really know where we're going with it at this point. Um, I guess we'll, we'll just start about songwriting technique, and both guys are, you know, they're known for their heavy music, but then they also have uh, another side to them, which is their their solo stuff, and it's quite different from you know what they became known for. So maybe there's there's variations in that that we can talk about, and um, and uh, let's let's just start off with the technique, like how you guys start your songwriting process, and then we can get into influences and all that and how that relates. So um, Scott. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> um, I don't know. I I, uh, I don't really do anything but write when I'm playing my guitar. I don't really. It's just kind of what I do. It's what I've always done. I don't, I'm always kind of searching for something that catches me, you know, and uh, something, some sort of slight alteration to something very simple that, that seems to lock into my brain and make it um, make it push me emotionally. Um, I've never been, I, I, you know, I have learned a few cover songs over my life, but I actually don't know anybody else's songs. I've never, um, aside from when I first learned how to play guitar and I was doing stuff like, you know, learning the first DRI 7 inch or some shit like that, you know. Um, I can't, I'm, I'm not a jam guy. Like, I, if you were to have some friends over with a circle of guitars, I'm not that guy. Because I'll just start playing some weird shit <laughs> that messes up everybody's jam. <laughs> but, uh, so I, when I'm, when I'm playing, I'm just. I'm just always tripping on what's what's coming out, and then the the whatever that is kind of dictates, um, kind of pushes it in whatever direction, whichever project um it goes to. You know. Scott, he's Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, Scott, are you ready? Scott, Mike, <laughs> check one two. Is this on? This. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys still drunk? <laughs> yeah, I got pretty drunk at our, uh, um, our listening party. Uh, you know, I think for me, you know, I come from a few different musical backgrounds, and I played band, I played drums in a number of bands, played bass in a number of bands. Um, I've always been a writer, even when I was doing those things, and um, um, and I've done a lot of different kinds of music over the years, and uh, whether it be punk or blues, or and I have played in jam bands before on bass and done a lot of different things. But uh, you know, when I'm when I'm writing a song, uh, I kind of feel like when I'm starting to get onto something that I'm going to be able to expand on is when I start to forget that I'm doing it. Um, and uh, when I start becoming absent and the riff or the circle of riffs becomes bigger and then things start kind of coming out of that, things start kind of emerging into it kind of by accident. Um, but I find that if I'm trying too hard, that it's not the right thing. Um, 
and uh, you know I've tried very hard to become you know maybe a decent enough player to be able to expand on ideas but um, when it comes down to actual ideas that really move me and become you know medicine um, it's there's not a lot of thought involved in it it's not trying to think you know if you ask me if you stop me at any moment go what chord is that I'd be like uh, you know and um, you know I'm not that player and I know I have a lot of friends that are very very accomplished players much better than I'll ever be that will tell you Oh well, that's a squishy G with a you know a, a minus slop, and they'll, they'll tell you about that, and um, and and there's value to that. Um, I've just never been that kind of writer. I've just always been a punk rock kid, and and I, I think in a lot of ways I still am, and I just write what feels good and what has a flow and a progression that that feels right, and. Uh, and it has to be something that I feel all the way because I can't, I can't put a microphone in front of it. I can't stand on the stage. I can't, um, I can't do this stuff if I don't feel it all the way. And that doesn't mean that anybody has to like it. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean that. It's not about that. It's about what's coming out of me to make me still feel like it's worth doing. Um, so as far as that goes, uh, that can be any number of genres. That can be a folk song, that can be a, a rock tune, that can be a punk rock tune, that can be a metal tune, that can be a yob tune, whatever it is. But um, that's my criteria. That's the only way I can keep doing it. I, yes? I've got a question. So you both were raised on the west coast of America. And can everyone uh, hear that in the back, the question? OK. Uh, from the West Coast, so you came, you're about my age, I think, and uh, metal Maybe. was happening in, uh, <laughs> in the late 80s, early 90s, I'm sorry, 80s, and then you guys took over, especially Neurosis, I think. Yob, I think, came in a little later. But how did that affect you growing up? I mean, and how you create your music is what you heard, and DRI, that's an excellent... You're asking me about... Metal's influence on what we're doing and growing up on the West Coast, yeah. Um, well, the scene that I, the first scene that I was ever in was um, down in San Diego when I was a kid. Um, that's where I lived when I was like okay. uh, 12, 13, 14. I lived in San Diego, so the first shows I was going to, there was like our big band there, our local band, was this band, Battalion of Saints. And Battalion of Saints um, not only played Motorhead songs, but they had a lead guitarist who, for those who saw him play, would understand that the dude was immense. I mean, he had a titanic influence on me as a kid. The dude played recklessly. He was raw as fuck. He was... He was like like Hendrix on speed, you know. It was just a whole different deal. And they played it. They put. They had a lot of metal influence in their music, and they and they did it unapologetically. And through them, I found a lot of other metal. That was it was through them and through tape trading. You know, I'd be tape trading with somebody, and they would send me something. You know, Sabbath or Venom or. Even ACDC, I mean, aside from the shit that was on the radio, you know, like the older stuff, and, and uh, you know, it was an easy transition. I've never been real, uh, I don't really care what kind of music it is as long as I like it, you know? I mean, and so, you know, a lot of that, a lot of metal's got a lot of power, a lot of emotion, and that's all I really give a shit about, you know? So. All right. Um, picture this, uh, 1983, me and, me and Woodshop class wearing like a, like a blazer with like, you know, real crazy plaid and pretty ripped up jeans and, you know, maybe some fucked up Converse, um, and like a little thin tie, like you see, you know, like, you know, you know Doc Johnson, and, uh, and then I'm... I'm wood shopping a plaque of Black Sabbath, you know, <laughs> with my hair spiked to the ceiling. Um, so that was kind of, that was me, man. I, 
I was a heavy metal kid for sure. Um, I was a punk rock kid too, and back then they just I kind of got my ass kicked by both crowds because neither one really mixed yet. Um, so there was yeah. a lot of friction, a lot of friction. You went to the, you went to go see, you know, like Megadeth or something, then that's one crowd. You go to see Dead Kennedys, that's another crowd. You go see Motorhead, and then you get those crowds coming together. And it's just fights all night, um, and serious. You know, it wasn't. There was nothing friendly about it. And so, um, where I grew up, it was a hick, hick town, and so um, I just I grew up fighting. And it was the only way that I could be myself because I wasn't going to cut my hair and I wasn't going to not, this music actually for the first, you know, I mean, just like anybody when you're a kid, man, and you find that music that just makes you come alive. All of a sudden you went from everything that you've been taught to all of a sudden you come online as a person and you start having an identity where you connect in with this music and you start finding yourself in this art. And so where I came from, it was just not remotely okay. And so, uh, and this is in a very small town. And then luckily, over years, you find that this community is all over the place. And this community is, is uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a lot of years for it to come to what it is now. Um, it used to be much more difficult. But, uh, you know, my, my upgrade, upbringing, had everything to do with Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Dead Kennedys and uh, Doctor No and uh, nuclear, you know, uh, nuclear assault and neurosis, pain of mind. That was a big deal, you know. That was a big deal to me. So uh, um, that's my answer. Awesome. I, just elaborate on it for a second because I was just thinking when you were talking that I. You know, at some point there, when I was like 15, I ran away and I ended up in the Bay Area. And the Bay Area was such a different scene than San Diego was. And Did you grow up on the West Coast? Yeah, born in San Francisco. Okay, so, um, I mean, has anybody who's seen like American Hardcore or any of those movies knows that, you know, West Coast was a really violent, violent punk rock scene. And, and in turn, turned the metal scene very violent at the time. And... And as Mike said, the shows when the two bands, when, when Motorhead would play, particularly, it got real ugly. But when I got to the Bay Area, it was a different, it was a different vibe to it. The punks and the metalheads were basically united, um, and the skinheads were the ones that everybody was fighting. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it was uh, because of bands like Exodus and Metallica, um, and then, you know, kind of the the second or third generation of those bands, Sacrilege BC, which our bass player played in, and then the Attitude Adjustment and Verbal Abuse, and these bands, you know, they had all this metal influence that were coming from more of a punk rock side. It, the whole thing just blended together. And, at, you know, not too long after that, I mean, by the mid-90s, there was no real discernible line socially between the punks and the metalheads in the, in the East Bay for sure. I mean, we all hung out together and it was real tight, so. Um. Do you feel that you guys, you both brought up the fact that you were both into punk rock and metal. I'm like, today, like a lot of kids that start metal bands, they only listen to metal bands. You know, those bands that they listen to happen to be influenced by stuff, but like how many bands that start today that like send they send demo tapes and shit all the time to the label that wow we're big fans of Sleep and like that's their perspective is from Sleep but not knowing that Matt Pike was into what he was into and like what you guys do it has its own sound and it doesn't sound derivative and it's it, I think it's the mixture of those two things and the energy of those two things that creates so like yeah, being able to draw influence from, from not just one focused thing like, God, it's just amazing that you, you go these days and you see a lot of opening bands and it's like, you can tell that they're listening to Sabbath Four, because that's exactly what they sound like, but, it's things can just be it just it makes so much more sense and and it becomes more um, uh, interesting when it's coming from so many different angles. Well the. the 
I certainly wasn't in on the early punk scene, but you know, I came in on the hardcore scene like '81, um, and at that point there was still remnants of the early punk scene, which was a really you don't really know where anybody's coming from. There was so many different sounds, so many different people. Like it was really bizarre and pretty interesting and and pretty dangerous and strange all the time. And so I think that that kind of stuck with me. So I was never really afraid to try different, you know, listen to different music. You know, I mean, I just always, I don't know, I just love music. It's, you know, I mean, no one's gonna tell me not to listen to. To fucking Coltrane, you know, Jesus Christ, listen to the motherfucker. He's a, you know, I mean, it's, it cuts you in half, you know, I mean, it's, um, good music is good music and it's good for your soul to listen to it. So, um, I would encourage music fans to listen to as much music as possible, but whatever that would be, you know, and be adventurous, <laughs> you know, definitely. Good. Um, it, it, yeah, yeah, so you had your hand up while they were talking about something earlier there. Um, so, you, Scott, you said you're not really a jam kind of a guy. Um, how, um, how does that affect when you try and write with other people? Do you, I mean, do you generally write on your own, or do you, do you sit down with other people and work stuff out together? And... I guess what I mean by saying I'm not a jam kind of guy is that, like, you know, if people are sitting around playing, oh, now we're going to play this tune, we're going to play that tune, okay. you know, and, like, this. A lot of people, they have like a, I, this is my, this is my perception, my experience. There's a lot of people that walk around with 50 or 60 songs that they can bust out on an acoustic guitar. Now we're going to bust this out and, you know, uh, everybody know this one? You know? <laughs> I see that, you know, I live, I live, you know, I live, I live in a, a smaller, shittier mountain town than Mike does, actually, three hours south of him. And, uh, and uh, I don't live in the city anymore, and so you, I run into a lot of that kind of shit, and I know you grew up around that shit, you know, it's mainly this kind of hippie thing, but, like, it's, uh, you know, I, like, I can't, I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know, you know, let me do this, you know, minor yeah. fucking two-note dissonant thing. Which is awesome, but, <laughs> but yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, with, with, uh, and neurosis, we start songs in every possible way you could imagine. I mean, literally from, you know, kicking a table over to, uh, to uh, writing a guitar riff. I mean, and everything in between. Um, Correction's House has been, uh, <laughs> as you'll see today, uh, very experimental. And, uh, I mean, like, we literally don't really know what we're going to do today except for two songs. <laughs> And we've got an hour to fill, so um, we've kind of written out some ideas, but we're going to get up there and kind of make some shit up. So that is kind of jam, yeah. and that is kind of freeforming, and I love that. I, I mean, I love that, um, particularly being uh, being sober now for however many years I've been sober. I, I was not sober for so long that I can't remember how long I've been sober. But I, I uh, that's how I get high now, is by doing dumb shit like that, you know, just playing without practicing and, you know, like having to figure stuff out on the fly. And, um, so I don't know, if I, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I got lost. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess for both of you, how important is the physical environment you're in when you're writing songs? Like how different is it from when you're home with your families and you're like mountain towns or whatever? to when you're on the road in some crazy place? Um, you know, sometimes, occasionally I'll get this idea, like particularly if I'm in a, what I feel is like maybe a dry period, um, where like, well, I, I need an environment. You know, I can't do this at home. I need like an office or, you know, somewhere I can go and just close the door and, and yada yada, you know, and I'll think that, but it never really works out that way, you know, it really, um, where the ideas come is when they come, and sometimes they don't come in the ideal environment, sometimes you'll be sitting in a van, sometimes you'll be at work, and the riff comes and grab your phone and go yada yada yada, and you know, then you try to remember it, um, uh, you know, and I can spend time in like, you know, like lighting candles and 
Start to get some incense going, <laughs> try to write a riff, and it never works out very well. It just it's contrived and 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 it's just it's just reaching, you know. And and reaching's okay, you know. Fuck reach, man. I mean, you you gotta. There, there's a lot of ways to to do it, um, and it's all good. But I think that for me, um, you just have to just not stop, and the moment will come. You know, and when you've been doing it for long enough, you just have a certain amount of faith, you know, that, that that's going to come. And and then the flip side to that is what is the goal, you know, and the goal, I think, really is medicine, right? It's medicine, you know, it's medicine for yourself. It's medicine to dig deep and just kind of continue to to deal with having a nervous system and, and and, you know, express what your life is in that moment. And so um, I, I think that when I do the best is when my expectations and ideas don't go any farther than that. And so then at that point, it's not an environment at all. It's just keeping up at it, you know. I mean, I've written songs in the bathroom, written songs in my bedroom, written songs on tour, written songs at Buddy's house, you know, you name it. So. Yeah, I would say the same. There's no... I just, whenever I grab a guitar, I write. So, and like you said, I've got riffs every possible place you can imagine and notes written down in my fucking wallet and in every notebook I have. And I've got like six notebooks and none of them are full and not, you know, all over the place. So I just, wherever, whenever. No rhyme or reason to it. <laughs> cool. Here? Yeah. Um... You both obviously have your, your main projects, being Neurosis and Job, and you have your solo, more, more acoustic work. Um, at, when, at what point when writing songs do you make that distinction that this is going to be Neurosis or a Job song, or is this is going to be a solo project? Would you say that like neuro the main projects are more uh, of a spiritual thing and the solo project more personal, like in family related? Or when do you make that distinction when you are writing songs? <coughs> Uh, to me, it's just the song kind of sp speaks for itself, honestly. I don't know if that makes sense, but it does to me. It just, you know, the song kind of tells me where it wants to, where it wants to be, and what it wants to do, and how it wants to be presented. I mean, I've had songs that I can, um, when I listen to them, when they're done, I could see that they could have gone either direction, but for some reason, they wanted to be. They wanted to be neurosis song, or they wanted to be a solo song, or whatever. Um, as far as the spirituality of it, um, you know, there's nothing more spiritual than my belief in my family. You know, honestly, I mean, that's all I got. So um, that's the only, the only thing that I can actually tangibly hold on to at this point in my life. Everything else is, you know, so. Um, it's all about that for me, you know, and uh, and that's you know why we started Neurosis in the first place, you know, is to to have a family, you know. So um, we all deeply, deeply needed one, and we needed people that we could believe in and trust, and that's how we formed this band, you know, and that was the bond that we set, and that was the. Uh, the oath that we took to each other, you know, and that's why we're still standing. Besides a lot of fucking luck, honestly, <laughs> you know, a lot of luck that we're all, you know, still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real, you know, I mean, we're lucky. You know, I guess uh, a way I'd answer that question on kind of a stylistic level was uh, when when Yaw broke up and uh, for a period of time and I started Midian and there were a lot of people that wanted to know, it's like, well this kind of sounds like Yaw in, in ways. Why didn't you call it Yaw? You know, why did you have to start a new band name and then kind of fight for stuff all over again? And and I honestly kind of felt like that it was different. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm, I, I wrote songs in Yav and I wrote songs in Midian and I come from a similar place in those things. But to me, in a weird kind of autistic, compartmentalized way, 
they were different. You know, that's different. That's faster. That's this. I would have never made that choice in a Yob song. It would have been, you know, and that's just my internal dialogue that a person could agree or, or disagree with. Um, but for me, that was my experience. That those are just those are just very different things. And then, you know, well, if that was a Yob, so I would approach that differently, mentally, emotionally, whatever, than I did with Midian. And so, um, so there's that. But I think that. Um, you know, as far as those distinctions go, um, I don't know, for me, over time, things are, are starting to blur a lot more. And, you know, I mean, there's a, a, a song on the new Yob record that I think is highly, highly informed by my solo work. Um, and, uh, um, and it's much more wide open and finger-picked and, and, and not... It doesn't fit into any kind of, I think, category really at all. Um, and it's just from, I think, years of just still doing it. And so it's all starting to come together. And, and over time, especially 2014, when you start looking at the body of work that is out there in the world and, you know, and the body of work of an individual artist and, you know, all the places that we pull it from, you know, as you keep going, you start kind of wanting you know, to keep digging and, and things like genre names and things like any kind of rigid rules just are much less interesting, you know. It's much more interesting to, to, to if not, you know, in, in some kind of, uh, you know, not in any kind of like pretentious way, but just in an internal as an artist way, you know, how do I push myself farther? You know, maybe this isn't new ground for anyone else, but it's new for me. And so, therefore, for me, it's valid, you know. Question. So, a lot of popular songs on radio is uh, three to five minutes long, and yet you guys have songs that push ten minutes more. And how does that affect songwriting, when you're not writing for just a three to four minute song? You're writing for a twenty minute song, I mean. I don't know how to write a four minute song, <laughs> to be real honest with you. I mean, I understand how they work, and I like a lot of bands that write three and four minute songs, and I'm very, I'm very pop positive. You know, I don't, I, I, I like just music that moves me in whatever way. Maybe it's something that tears my heart out. Maybe it's just something that just is a pep in the step, whatever, you know. It's all good, um, but uh, I don't... You know, when it comes to like writing a Yob tune, occasionally we'll be like, oh, it'd be so rad to do like a shorter song or whatever, but it never, ever, ever works out that way because that's just not how I think. Uh, that's not how I write. Um, and uh, so. And I say maybe thank someday, you. For maybe the long someday. Songs. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. For I mean, both it's, bands, it's, really. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's kind of one continuous mistake in a way. You know, it just, it just it's beautiful. Unfolding. <laughs> For me, I just, I don't, I try not to think about it, you know, at all. I just don't, I don't care about the time Good. of the song, you know. I mean, if it's a three or four minute song, it's so be it, you know, but I have, I've written them, you know, I have. There's, there's Neurosis songs that are that long somewhere way back when, probably on the first record or something. Um, I think I've got a solo song, it's about five minutes, you know, it's my big... Radio hit, <laughs> but you know I just don't I don't think in terms of time, you know, for songs because that's again like you don't want to have these limits. That's like number one rule uh, to me when you're being creative is you know don't don't fucking trap yourself before you start you know by oh I gotta you know. <laughs> got to write a song that's this long or what at? I mean, I don't know. I don't, it's, it makes no sense to me at all. I, I'm, I know we're not alone in this. There's many, many musicians who feel the same way. Um, I was going to ask uh, if you both mind speaking a little bit about uh, writing lyrics as well, because obviously you spoke about writing riffs and stuff, uh, especially for Scott, because obviously Neurosis, like, it's not just you who who does the vocals, so when you write lyrics for Neurosis, do you sort of sing the lyrics that you write, or do you, how do you decide who, who they go to? Uh, typically, yeah. I mean, that's generally the approach we take because, well, for one, I think that um, whoever writes the lyrics kind of understands how they should be delivered and 
feels them on a different level. Uh, that being said, um, I think the, le the, the neurosis lyrics that hit me the hardest are the lyrics to A Sun That Never Sets, and Steve wrote those. So.